Thank you, steering committee, for sitting with me and uh, and hearing a little about me and why I am uh, going to win this seat for us in November. That's the most important thing: is we win this seat in November. I'm going to get my papers over here. So, your um, your steering committee put together a really good list of questions um, that they're they're asking every candidate a list of questions to see who they're going to endorse. Um, I want to try my best to get through those lists. Um, I'm first going to give you a little bit about me for those of you that are first time hearing about me, and uh, and maybe you'll like what you hear. And I think at the end of this, um, you don't know it yet, but you're really going to like me. Um, <laughs> maybe you even love me. Um, and uh, my name is Yaya. So if you agree with something, just say Yah. And if you really like what I say, really, just say Yah Yah. And uh, I'll know I'm doing something good here. All right. So, I uh, got into politics at 14, started teamdemocrats.org, and we were against the Iraq war before some Democrats even knew to be against it. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, that was, uh, that was good. Um, so, but um, we were against it, and we didn't know what to do, but we were young, and we had energy, we had our feet, and we went and protested uh, out in the streets, and it grew and grew, and we got 500 members uh, nationwide when I went to the National Youth Leadership Conference or some other youth event or YMCA Youth in Government. I would be getting kids involved, getting them involved, and uh, that allowed me to intern for Congresswoman Giffords. At 18, the first thing I did coming out of high school was work for her. And uh, do you guys remember her, Jennifer Cowell, who was uh, on her campaign? She, uh, she, I was like, Jennifer, you got to come to my high school. And she's like, Why? And I was like, Oh, you're going to see a lot of kids. And I'm there, and uh, she comes, and uh, in an auditorium, and there's a lot of kids. She's like, Yeah, yeah, I had no idea you got all these kids here. And I was like, Yeah, they really care. But she didn't know before that I was swinging a sign saying, EGs, free EGs, and uh, uh, hey, you gotta get some people that way. But uh, that led me to work for Congresswoman Giffords, and that is when I learned about the constituent base. That's when I learned that this district isn't heavily Republican or heavily Democrat. It is an ideal district. I think every district should be this way because this allows for the competition of ideas. It's a fierce battle to the end, but the person that wins has got to understand they represent everybody. Everybody. And I don't hold grudges. And I know that our misguided Republican allies on the other side, they're going to come around eventually. I hope it's sooner than later. Some of them are already saying this is not the party I recognize. Um, but we got to get some of those votes. we got to get some independence. And that's how we win. Um, so I understood that early. 19 years old, one year later. Uh, I was asked by Karen Ulick, the vice mayor of Tucson at the time, to co-chair her campaign. A 19-year-old had no idea how to do that, but I learned quick, and we won. And then uh, after that, I said, you know what, maybe I'm just a little too young to be so invested in politics. So I took a step back, I got an education, I got a business degree, then I went to law school at the U of A, business school at the U of A, and then for my third year of law school, finishing it up, I wanted to switch things up, and I got to go to China for my third year of law school to the best university in China, Tsinghua University in Beijing, founded by the US actually. Became the best university. And it's an interesting backstory. If you look it up on Wikipedia there, it'll give you a little idea about how forward thinking our country was at that time. No matter uh, what happened, we were still, you know, we, we, we accepted their apology and we, we created the best university in China. Um, was there for a year, then I got to have high level uh, interactions with government officials there, uh, working inside uh, that country intimately, learning about their tax incentives, uh, investment incentives, uh, the land structures, the, the industries that they're promoting for Made in China 2030. The, I witnessed the creation of the One Belt, One Road program, uh, which is now a pivot of China towards Asia, away from the US. So our days are numbered in terms of how much leverage we have over that country, and we gotta make it count right now. They created the AIIB bank at that time. Now it uh, almost has a trillion dollars in it. And they offered a seat for the US, and we said no. <laughs> Britain and Australia are like, are you kidding me? We're on board. Germany, on board. Uh, only us and Japan said no. Uh, I have no idea. You know, They felt like it was an attack on the Asian Development Bank, which was ours, but it hasn't be, been reinvented. 
We have stagnation institutions around the world right now that are not being reinvented to accommodate for the 21st century. And that's where I see a clear difference between myself and some other candidates. I have that expertise, that knowledge, that we can do that. And then um, I got to travel around Asia doing investment programs, meeting with high level uh, ministers of state. I worked a little bit with the UN on an initiative. I got a small country, East Timor, the second newest country to the world. Unfortunately, there was a lot of genocide in their life from Indonesia, and the uh, U.S. could have prevented that, and we didn't. Um, but I'm there to make it right, and uh, we helped them adopt a couple things to bring more investment. And uh, at that time, I said, all right, three, three years is enough in Asia. I'm coming back home. So I, I went and visited a lot of my family in San Diego. Uh, I had enough money to survive a little bit, and uh, I uh, got to be with my brother, who just graduated from Princeton, and uh, we had never lived together for over seven years. So we lived together, we had a good relaxation, and then I, uh, I said, all right, I'm, I'm, I gotta come back home. I gotta come back home, this is where I can make a difference. This is where I can do it. I see a broken Congress, I see constant war, and I see an economy that doesn't work for everybody. It's not rocket science. This is not rocket science. And it, it breaks our heart. I think every one of you are so compassionate individuals, it breaks your heart to see the way this country's going, and the people running it. And just the flat out, misunderstanding of the issues and and it's just so basic now that we have to the bar has been lowered so low for who is running for Congress these days we've got a Stephen King in in office my god confederate racist I mean when are they gonna realize that this is just not good and the word progressive is the future of the Democratic Party it is what you're doing is you're thinking long term you're thinking long term, and I told the folks in the steering committee, it's not the next election that we gotta be focusing on, it's the next generation. And that's what some other countries are able to do because of their structure. We gotta, we gotta focus on that because some things we're doing now are irreversible. Um, before I get started into um, the questions here, do you guys have any questions about my life story or any questions uh, about what I've talked about so far? I'll give you uh, a little bit of time. Yes, ma'am. You're starting a little late. I'm starting just on time. Yeah. yeah. Um, I agree with you that traditionally these campaigns go a lot longer. I agree with you that uh, these presidential campaigns are now a billion dollars and two years running. I'm tired of that. I'm really tired of that. And I think everybody in this country, we don't know it yet, but I think when the signs go up on every corner, you're going to be like, uh. And um, I didn't want to be a part of that. I felt, I felt like we could do things as efficient as other campaigns, but in even less than half the time. And one of the milestones was uh, at the camp, at the Catalina uh, Magnet High School debate, where they're like, oh, you got in so late. You're not gonna even have the signatures. No, we should have our volunteers help you get signatures. Well, guess what? I said, hey, it's not a problem. Don't worry about it. And here we are. We doubled the amount of signatures. We got third out of the seven in signatures in just two and a half months. And we, were, we didn't get second by five signatures, and we submitted a day early, and those numbers are disclosed. So maybe someone had a little time to get a little more. Um, we, uh, we did really well on that, and that's not that big a deal. But I'm telling you, we can do things very efficiently. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business guy, and I, I know how we can do this. And uh, I think we're just as effective, if not more, than a lot of the other candidates right now. We're doing a lot of things that uh, we can't get too much into our strategy, but uh, we're doing things that no other campaign is doing right now. And, it, and even with our limited resources compared to some other candidates, we're making things happen. We're making things happen and it goes to about what I was talking about earlier, about leaving improvements as we go. Uh, if I'm gonna say this one more time, I, I'm sorry for the steering committee because I just heard, completely said this already, but uh, we are tired of campaigns being a means to an end. I want campaigns to be an end in themselves. That way they leave improvements as they go. It's possible. You're talking, I, I'm talking about an intergenerational mentoring program for all Americans. Why can't I start it now? Guess what, we're piloting that program. It's called the Grand Mentor Program. We're gonna be piloting. Uh, we gotta have music and art competition, more music and art. Why can't you have a music and art competition right now running? Why can't you feed the homeless right now running? Why can't you uh, get your, your donors to donate as well to the Florence Project? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things. Why can't you have your volunteers getting the Outlaw Dirty Money petition signed? Yeah. We, can, we can do that. 
let's be, let's get the candidates creative because they have a lot of money. But at the end of the day, there's only one that wins. But everyone else just treats it as a means to an end. Let's treat it as an end in itself that every candidate is starting to get um, uh, the standard of the candidacy, the legitimacy of their candidacy, the viability of their candidacy is how much improvement they made on the campaign trail. They have a lot of money and the FEC doesn't say no to it. So let's, let's, let's reinvent that idea. Let them build the communities that they're talking so much that they're gonna improve. Start now, not later. So, okay. I have a question for you. You said that you come from San Diego. And then you said after you traveled in Asia, you decided to come home. Since we have had a question regarding uh, Andrew sure. Patrick, there was a problem with the, the suitcases in your apartment. Uh, where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> I love that question because you'll find out that I'm in Tucson. I mean, uh, this district is my home. I was born at TMC, went to high school here, college here. I won this school? Mountain View High School. Uh, it's in the district. Uh, two, I got the Tucson Student Service Award, first place. I was recognized by Mayor Bob Walkup, even, Republican. And I got that award because of the contribution I made to my community. San Diego is only a home in the fact that all my family lives there. They, they, they moved there. So uh, I had missed my family for three years. Uh, my mom and dad are here. Uh, but my, my, I have a huge family. And I love seeing them. She was just on the phone. I was calling my little cousin happy birthday, telling him to kiss everybody in the house. Um, they're just there, and that's where my heart is sometimes. And that's just my family. I'm a family guy. So I wanted to go recharge my batteries, and uh, they're all there. I'd be, I'd be in Alaska if they were in Alaska, but they're in San Diego conveniently. So um, how long have you lived in Tucson? 25 years, excluding the three years outside of, four years. I spent uh, in San Diego and San Francisco, I spent a little time, uh, like less than a year. But majority of my life has been here. But I think it's an asset. I think it's an asset to have that international experience. I think it's an asset to see what they're doing in California. Because I think a lot of you can identify with progressives in California. So uh, it's good to see that. It's good to see that. Yeah, you would, some of them may not be aware of your cultural heritage. Oh, yeah. You've shared a lot of that with us. Would you mind sharing it with sure, us? Sure, yeah. So um, I am Persian and a Turkish Kurd. My dad is Kurdish and my mom is from Tehran. Uh, mom came just before the Iranian Revolution and uh, she had to leave with her family because of what was happening in that country. Dad uh, was a best-selling author at 23 in Turkey uh, and it, he was writing books against the government. And at that time, the military coup happened and they sent him to prison for four years. Tortured, killed people in prison that thought they thought was him. They killed his brother. Uh, it was a vicious time and he came to Tucson. And he came to Tucson uh, after spending four years in prison. They, they said, you know what? Denounce your books against the government and we'll let you out. He said, no, no. And that's, my, that's, that's who raised me. You know, a man with that kind of integrity. My dad's never lied in his life. He's the happiest person in the world. And my mom has always cared for me. And uh, it hasn't always been easy in Tucson. I mean, we, we were on food stamps for a while, uh, but my mom was working two jobs as my dad went to law school. And we made it work. And uh, now she's a diabetes educator at TMC. She's been a dietitian for several decades. And she's cared for thousands of Arizona patients. And my dad's a Pima Community College professor. You know, these are immigrants that have tremendously impacted their community. You know, it's not a, it, you know, a lot of people are actually trending that way to realize immigrants help your country. Long-term economic growth is productivity growth plus a labor force. Our labor force right now is like 1.7% increase per year. Ain't that much, we need that. And it's a farce for them to think and I know you guys can agree on this, that these migrants are taking American jobs. No, they're not taking the way you think they are. They're, oh, they're decreasing our wages. No, they're not. These poor people make $11,000 a year, and they give some of that money as remittance to their families in Mexico. Oh, well, why are they taking money out of the US? Listen, if they didn't do that, you'd have a lot more people coming up from Mexico. They're barely surviving. You know, that gets to immigration, and it's not the issue of the border, come on. It's not the border. Let's, let's solve the problem. Why are so many people coming? It's because of the economic despair and suppression of civil rights in those countries. Why are we set talking about that? Why are we talking about the women running in Mexico for politics and they're being killed? 
for writing? There's some tough questions to ask, and no one's really getting to the table to, I don't have all the answers, but I know where the problem is. And until the, the, we come to a consensus about the problem and where the problem is and the root cause, we'll never get, we'll just be continually to try to fix a consequence of a bigger problem. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it works. I love it. It works. <laughs> wow. It took me by surprise. But yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. And, um, just for some of you that don't know, and I don't talk about this too much because I gotta, I represent my district. You know, my district's not really Kurdish or Persian, but uh, this is a monumental moment for a lot of Kurds around the world. Uh, Forty million Kurds are now looking at me and seeing this as an inspiration of hope that they don't have a country, but they have someone in America that was born and raised, is, has their blood, is running for Congress, and can be a bridge. And they are actually the key to our success in the Middle East. It is perfect. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, it's something that I can bridge. And there's actually a bipartisan Kurdish caucus. 50, 50 members of House are in that. I can be the leader of that because of I'm Kurdish. You know, they need, they need a voice. They, and that voice will bring unity. And unity will bring power. And they want our friendship. And we've betrayed it in the past. But we can regain that trust. And having someone with their, their blood actually does help them in some way. Uh, and the Iranian community has never had someone in the office as well. And uh, right now, with what's happening with Iran, we need more than ever someone that understands that country, that can really speak truth to power about what the devastating consequences are of removing ourselves from that agreement, what the devastating consequences are down the road we're, uh, we're giving in to countries that want to see that civil war in that country. Yeah. We're, just, I mean, we're going down the wrong path, and we're beating the war drum again and again. I haven't, that noise hasn't left my head since I was 14. You know, yes, sir. Well, uh, a question about the next door neighbor, um, Turkey. Yeah. Oh. Um, you know, I mean, we have, we have Erdogan in power now, and what's to prevent um, Russia, for example, from prying Turkey out of NATO. Yeah. That seems to me to be a major coming issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's surprising that we allow, I mean, there's so many issues with that, that in Turkey right now, and he just won the election yesterday. Uh, won it. Um, yeah, Erdogan, he's, an, he's a, you know, he's again, you know, president of the country. Um, committing genocide across the border, oppressing a big population, um, bringing nationalism out, bringing arrogance out, and uh, they have our nuclear weapons in their country. Yeah. We, we have nuclear weapons in their country. You know, we've catered to them so much, and they keep getting pulled to Russia. What is going on? We're not doing the right policy. The nicer we are to him, the more he thinks he can take advantage of us. To the point, he beats Americans in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I don't know if some of you know this, yeah. but yeah. 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 oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Not even a slap on the wrist. Yeah. Caught in red handed, instigating violence against peaceful protesters. Yeah. Some of them I actually know. I met them in Washington. Uh, and. Uh, it's just, uh, it baffles my mind how an authoritarian can come to U.S. soil and do what he does everywhere else. He bashed the doors of the United Nations, too. And we support that. But he ain't the only dictator we support, right? <laughs> what are we doing? You know, how many dictators do we support? How many of our allies are we, are we against? This is not rocket science. <laughs> this is not rocket science. And, uh, and your generation and my generation and every generation is gonna be feeling the consequences of this. And I'm so happy that you're here because you're on the right side of history. No matter what happens, you're on the right side of history and you can know that you did the right thing. And uh, it's crazy how some people don't get that. And um, I'm happy that you guys are here and I'm happy you're taking the time to listen to me. Uh, am I moving around too much? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you want me to get into the questions quickly? I won't take too much time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, this is where you guys are just, you know. Disclaimer, we can sometimes disagree 
but you know, you know, we, there's common ground we can still find together. We don't have to agree on everything to find the common ground we believe in. So if there's one thing you're like, oh no, I don't like, well let's, let's put that in the compartment and like, let's try to find the common ground. Um, we won't agree on everything. That's just not how politics are, but we gotta get together on some things. So, um, do, uh, well, should I read the questions out? Yes. All right. Do you believe the federal government should ensure that all Americans have health insurance coverage? What system or approach would you favor? We are almost there with coverage. We're 91% there. We just have a little more. We got to expand, expand some of our systems, but also decrease the costs. Um, I am for universal and affordable health care for everybody from the day they're born to the day they die. Oh, hey, yeah. Um, there are completely clear things that we can do in our healthcare system to reduce costs dramatically. Um, and everyone, I don't think, d disagrees on it. Like, lower pharmaceutical costs by at least requiring them to set the prices to the international average that they're selling abroad, even though they make it here. They sell it, you know? And also, let's re reduce the, uh, let's, let's lift the restrictions on buying pharmaceuticals from outside the US as well, like yeah. Canada. Hey, uh, um, insurance companies, oh golly. Um, you know how much the bureaucracy of hospital networks and insurance companies fighting over bills? How much inefficiency that causes in the system? It's like 25% of the cost. Come on now, we can get rid of that. Um, they're playing games, they're playing games. Obviously, sometimes doctors do a little more than necessary for some of the patients, and I get it. Uh, but that's not the case for everywhere. And it's really hurting the system having that kind of inefficiency. Um, uh, also, we gotta have proactive versus reactive medicine a lot of time. My mom's a diabetes educator. You know, that's a big deal. That's a big epidemic coming. And uh, we gotta really be proactive with a lot of that. Uh, but the biggest one single thing in healthcare that I don't see that needs to happen is technological innovation. It needs to be about the consumer revolution in that it is easily accessible for all of us. Now everyone doesn't use a smartphone or everyone doesn't feel comfortable having their medical records on a smartphone, but it is insane to see a specialist. Right now you gotta go, you gotta schedule with the scheduler to get with the doctor. The doctor has to schedule with the scheduler of the specialist, and then you gotta go to the specialist. It's like, come on. It's just a, it, and by the time you do it, it's like five months away. Uh, there are so many things that technology can help in this industry that we're not there yet. And we need to focus on it, because that's the only way we're really gonna reduce a lot of costs. Um, but we have to do it. This is, a, this is more important to me than a lot of military spending we've got, especially when one, 21 trillion of it is unaccounted for. All right, what are your thoughts about veteran health care and what can be done to improve it? Should, should we privatize uh, health, uh, veterans health care? Uh, no, <laughs> no, and they're trying to gut it. The, the Koch brothers are trying to gut it. Uh, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, and they're trying to gut education too. Oh, look how bad it is. Well, it's, so, it's not doing as good as it should because you're not giving it any money or giving it the high-level expertise that it needs. The people running the VA should have that expertise to cut, I mean, it's a, it's a mind boggle. I mean, how big the complex issue, but you gotta have someone competent there to do it. We gotta fill the vacancies. We gotta do a lot of things, but there's excellence of care in the VA, and if you've got it, and you, these poor veterans, some of them don't know that it's bad to privatize. Yeah. Some of them think what they hear on the news about, oh, I wanna pick my own doctor. These doctors don't know about the certain detailed illnesses and consequences of combat that VA doctors know about. And I can't get too much detail, unfortunately, I wish I knew a little more, but I was being told about some experts, like. Some doctors would have no idea about the illnesses and, and damage and injuries that you can get in combat. And the VA doctors specialize in that. They know these, these patients really well. We've got to keep it that way. All right. <clears throat> if elected, how will you work to decrease the cost of prescription drugs? I already talked about it. We've got we to gotta really bring it down. Right now, you can't even negotiate the prices of it. Um, uh, Reimportation, I think, is important from other countries. Uh, we've got to have it makes no sense that a pharmaceutical company makes the drug here, but sells it for the most expensive price here. Um, but that goes to their influence in campaign finance and lobbying and all that, which is a systemic problem that we gotta get rid of. Um, <clears throat> what is your position on Medicaid 
work requirements? No. Uh, these people, the people that are on Medicaid, it's because their children need it, because the parents can't afford it for the children. Um, making them work is not the solution. Well, I think most people, if they're able to work, will work. I think it's a misconception thinking people on entitlements will never pick up a, a, a job in their life. You know, that's just simply untrue. Um, I think we have to support these people with training programs, helping them to, to get the jobs, but requiring them to have a job to give health care to their children? No. All right? What will you do to safeguard women's reproductive rights and freedoms? I think this is something every Democrat is on the same page with. I will vote for Planned Parenthood uh, supported bills. I, I respect the rights and decisions of women to make their own health care decision. I think this is, this, this is what has to be done. It just is common sense. And uh, we got to get people that are um, judges in SCOTUS, uh, the Supreme Court, that support Roe versus Wade and, and uh, continue that effort. Um, the Supreme Court right now is just bizarre how it's supposed to be removed from politics and it's not removed from politics. Everyone's voting party line in there. We just found out the gerrymandering. Yeah. 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 Really. Wow. Um, as a lawyer, it really upsets me that the so political in, in the Supreme Court, no matter how the district judges unanimously agreed that this was wrong, this gerrymandering case was wrong, they said no, exactly on party lines, whatever. All right, public education. <laughs> what are your thoughts on charter schools? Uh, I went to a charter school for middle school and it was such a great experience for me. There, let's not think that all charter schools, schools are bad. I think a lot of them are good. I think they should be developed as well as public schools. Um, I, think, um, I think in this issue, we're, we're again fighting the consequences of a lack of funding. Um, I, I, it's ha I hate it when public schools are fighting against charter schools for pennies. They should both be given money. Um, but this voucher program is a step in the wrong direction because it's, I, I can tell because I know who supports it. Uh, the Coe brothers, they're never <laughs> up to any good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a question here. We have a system in, that's been legislated in, uh, in this state. Mm -hmm. That is essentially a money laundering scheme for charter schools, and that's got to stop. Yeah, you're right. There's bad apples in every batch. I agree, but not every one of them is bad. No, I'm not. I, I'm, I'm, I agree, though. We got to fight it where we case by case basic basis. Uh, there are charter schools that absolutely take advantage of a system and are not teaching a, a solid education. But then there are some that are just out in Tucson. You have some from basis. I went to ALL, Accelerated Learning Lab. My brother graduated from high school from that, that school, and, and he and his fellow uh, students went, and they're not, they didn't have to be the brightest, or they're not the richest, or, but they got to go, every one of them went to an Ivy League. I think every child has the ability to go to an Ivy League. It's just about teaching. It's about how we teach them and raise them. They're, they're a sponge, they can do anything. My brother's not a genius, I love my brother, and he's smart, but he was doing college algebra in fifth grade at that school. I was begging to do simple algebra in, in fifth grade when I went to a public school. And it's not a, it, pu public schools are fundamental to our society. And back then, when there was Republicans fighting against not giving everybody K through 12, and now people take it for granted as a, as a right for every student, we had to fight for that. And our fight's not over, we gotta fight for community college free two-year community college. We gotta fight for zero interest university, at the very least. We gotta build stronger vocational programs because which leads into here about AI and automation, it is coming so, excuse me, so fast. I'm seeing it every day. Jobs being taken, jobs being taken. I can go into great detail. But by 2030, expect 50 million jobs to be lost. What are we gonna do then? Kids are gonna be competing against people with years of experience for the same job. It's not fair. We've got to have vocational training programs now that can train someone in less than five months for a job that's already waiting for them. And if it's an expensive program, we'll take it from a percentage of their first year salary. That way you guarantee the job and you don't have anyone in debt. Yes? I don't think you answered this question. He wasn't about, question about charter schools. He wasn't questioning whether or not some charter schools are good and some are bad. He was just talking about the principle of what the charter school system is. 
Oh, you're saying that the that takes the money. construct in this right. state mm -hmm. allows proprietors of charter schools to that. essentially, um, uh, 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 after a period of time, a mm -hmm. short period of time, sell the school mm -hmm. and reap the profits completely. I, I thought I answered it where I say I agree that that's wrong, but not everyone does it that way. Uh, the system is it shouldn't be allowed at all. Right. That's my point. Sure, change well, it. A CD2 candidate is not going to have yeah. much control yeah. over yeah. Arizona yeah. legislature. Any control. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we do fund, I mean, the federal government has a role to play in funding education. And I think it's an issue of a lack of funds that now we have a divide in our, in our theology on how education should be built. But when you pay your teachers the lowest in any, any other state, you're obviously, you, come on. Come on, I mean, this is the illogical, it's not rocket science again, this is not rocket science. Um, you gotta invest in it. You gotta have kids allowed to have um, as much resources as possible at this age. Um, universal preschool is an absolute necessity. Um, one in three single parent families here are in poverty. Uh, they can't send their kids to preschool. We gotta have these kids in preschool. It helps the family, but it also helps the kid getting a running start in kindergarten. They don't get that, then they're years behind. Uh, go look at economicintegrity.org. I mean, that was it's a local organization. Um, say it again. Economicintegrity.org. Uh, they say that one of the biggest factors. I met with their their executive director, and they said the biggest factor is preschool. Got to have kids in preschool. And uh, I was like, okay, sign me up. Let's do it. You convince me. They they know how expensive it is to be poor in, in this country. All right. Um, public safety. Uh, okay, this is about gun violence. Um, okay, <laughs> this is another crazy issue. Uh, 96 deaths a day, uh, 30,000 a year almost. Um, I think uh, this is something that we're going to have to fight tooth and nail for because the NRA has already brainwashed a lot of minds in this country. Um, I think there is very little funding for the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Department. They're not able to do background checks as much as they should. We have to boost background checks. We have to increase child access prevention measures so kids don't access a loaded gun in the house. We gotta address um, the issue of micro stamping ammunition. Now, try to follow me on this one. I, I think this was a great idea. Um, for all the homicide cases out there, whenever you shoot a gun and the casing flies out, the, the perpetrator doesn't ever go pick up the casing. Imagine if a detective could find the casing, look at the micro stamp, know exactly where it was sold, find that person easily. We can do that. I mean, we, it's very difficult for us to control the amount of guns in this country at this point and everyone that owns it, but we can control the ammunition. Uh, I think that is very strong. We obviously have to absolutely ban military-grade weapons. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Come on. Um, I think I am not against people having home protection. I think most people are not against people having home protection. But this is something that Republicans got to get right, that one measure in the right direction doesn't mean we're taking all their guns away. They, they, they think this is like some huge slippery slope avalanche. That one idea to reduce gun violence in our schools and in our community would eventually lead to taking all their rights. Come on. This is the NRA, this is mainstream media, this is all this hype up. Uh, it's just we don't have a common set of facts. One of the things that a congressional person can do is increase the funding for the CDC yeah, who have been definitely. prevented from investigating the health effects of guns in the community. That's Absolutely. certainly one thing. That thank God, I mean, thank God for Giffords, you know, bless her, she's still fighting. And uh, I get a lot of my data from the Giffords organization. Um, and I'm learning a lot from that website every day. And imagine if the resources, the CDC, <laughs> we gotta do it. But did you know about this, uh, this three-day waiting default process where if an investigation, a background investigation, or background check is done, and the investigators from the ATF don't finish it in three days, you automatically have to give the gun to that person. And that's how a majority of prohibited people get their gun. It's what horrible. A stupid idea. <laughs> and they're trying to say, oh, concealed weapons across every state. 
you know? Not even simple training for these kind of things. I mean, come on, the NRA should have been on our side. The NRA should have said gun safety. Yet they're trying to support mentally ill people to have access to a gun, severely mentally. I'm not talking like, oh, I'm a little depressed. I'm talking like I'm, I have serious thoughts of suicide. Been hospitalized. Yeah. And on the no-fly zone. <laughs> the, not I the no-fly zone, I, the no-fly <laughs> list. So, yeah. yes, uh, people that are on no-fly lists can have a gun, get access to gun. They're not even prohibited. And also, people in domestic abusive relationships, like not, not husband, but boyfriend or girlfriend that's abusive. Um, the stalkers, they have a, them and domestic abusers have a very high rate of using guns against mm -hmm. someone in a homicide case. So uh, these are clear warning signs that we need to do more and we're fighting for that. Let's keep fighting for that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, follow up on if we can control the ammunition. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been something that, that I've wondered about forever, as far as I can tell. Why can't we control the ammunition? Why do we need ammunition that kills. Yeah. I mean, with our technology today, I mean, is, why is that ne never a conversation? I don't know, I don't know. And there's fire breathing rounds, shotgun rounds, that literally are incineration fireballs that are shot out. Uh, they're called fire breath shotgun rounds. What, who needs that? Uh, I, it blows my mind. It blows my mind someone can buy a big pack of 22s for like $10, <laughs> and no background check is required, not even a simple yeah. photocopy of your ID. <laughs> um, we gotta stop it at the ammunition. But you know, these gun lobbies have been so good. They're so good, and uh, they're so effective at what they do. And you, they have, the, the, the gun industry has such broad immunity that honestly isn't um, in any other industry how broad their immunity yeah. is from liability. So but what I don't understand is the Second Amendment doesn't say anything about ammunition. I know, right? I mean, it actually says something a lot about, you know, you have to join a, a militia. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> love you, uh, <laughs> Justice Scalia, bless you, rest in peace, my man, but you're a grammatician? Come on. But it yeah. says, everything it says is about guns, but it does not say jack squat about ammunition. Yeah. And I don't understand why we Democrats have been so stupid as to not try to go in on that. Yes, try. Let's do it. Let's I don't do it. see. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. You guys still you, yeah, are, 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 are we still okay to keep going with some of this stuff? Or do you want to hit some of the issues that well, I'll just say the issue topics. Civil rights, economic equality, immigration, environment criminal justice, voting rights, campaign financing, uh, any of those topics, if you want me to quickly talk on them. Campaign I'll financing. Is that okay? Can I do that one, even though she didn't raise her hand on that one? Oh. All right. All right. <laughs> campaign finance, one of my favorite topics. Uh, Lawrence Lessig has been a champion of this, and uh, even though he was a one-person issue, he ran for president in 2016, uh, he was a one-issue candidate, unfortunately. He even... Uh, naively said, oh, I'll resign once I get campaign finance reform and I'll give it to the vice president. That didn't go over so well for his campaign. Um, but he was, he brought up a great point about the systemic issue in our democracy, the unresponsiveness to the public. And this is something that puzzles us because we see that this is not rocket science, yet the completely opposite thing is happening. No matter a majority of Americans want something done in terms of policy, Congress is no more likely to do it. This is an empirical study done at Princeton. My brother showed it to me. He's like, yeah, yeah, check it out. And, um, but if the economic elite and special interests support a policy position on it, they are 60 times more likely to pass legislation in that favor. You won't know why? It's because I know firsthand what campaign finance is all about. I know firsthand that if I was doing this right, I would be raising $400,000 a quarter. I know if I was doing this right, I'd be spending 70% of my time fundraising. Not to say that I'm not gonna share envelopes with you, which I hope to do, but uh, <laughs> this is a problem. It is a problem. So I have a solution. We need 
What Clean Elections is doing for the state, I think is fantastic. I think the cleanelections.org or gov, whatever the website is for Arizona, is doing a fantastic job of educating voters on the candidates. We need public media to step up and become the, the, the major source of information on candidates, to vilify and to continue to expand debates and forums among the candidates in the earlier days so that we can get back to the merits so the candidate doesn't have to pay the huge cost of advertising and marketing, which is useless if you're trying to be a, politi a policy maker. You don't need marketing and advertising, but yet that is the integral part of my, my campaign. Um, if the public media can increase the, that, if we can get the disclosure requirements of campaign finance, but then also, I want every district to be the sole donor to the representatives running in that district. It doesn't really make sense for me to have a max donor from New York or San Francisco when I'm running in Tucson, Arizona, and in Cochise County, and Pima County, and Green Valley, Sarita. I don't get it. Why is someone from outside the district donating? Finance. Yeah, so let's keep it local. Let's keep make a voucher-based system. And a lot of people are, oh, vouchers, no. But let me tell you, it ain't gonna be a lot of money to bring democracy back, and it is a small price to pay to have democracy back in the power of the people. You don't want candidates like me going to super PACs. You don't want candidates like me getting into, uh, get, uh, allying with uh, PACs to do individual expenditures on my behalf, doing hate ads on TV. What you want, and I think you want, uh, is candidates on, on public radio, on public media, stacked up against each other so you can see who you like and continuously, continuously until a couple of months before the primary where then you are giving your voucher to put as much as the, the limit of money towards any individual candidate. So example, you had $20 and you like one of these congressional district races or a senator race or a presidential race, you put like five, 10, another five here. But in the aggregate, that's gonna be enough money because the candidate won't have to spend millions of dollars on advertising, useless advertising. I can make any defective and gross and decaying product look good on a TV ad. Come on. I Don't studied talk marketing. about Annie and Kirkpatrick like that. <laughs> no, 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 no. That wasn't. Hey, I, no, I, I don't talk bad about it, and that's not who I was thinking of. I was thinking about Steve, Steve King, all right? Um, no, no, no. That's another thing, is that we can't be doing irreparable harm to our fellow Democrats. Um, it's, uh, as you said, you know, we wish we could have one candidate running, which you do right here in front of you, that's going to win it. Um, but you, uh, we've got to support each other at the end of the day. And someone was asking me, would you support uh, whoever wins the nomination? Of course I would. And I would expect them to do the same for me. Because what we have as an alternative is not that pretty of a sight. You know what I'm saying? So we all, we all get that. We all get that. But I would never do that. I would never say that. And I don't believe in that kind of GOP style stuff. Um. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I want to suggest that, that, that the, uh, the problem is not that so few people have so much. The problem is that so many don't have enough. Income inequality is not, is, is not the disease. That's the symptom of the disease. The disease is economic injustice. Mm -hmm. And that's the disease that needs to be cured. Mm -hmm. And the, the symptoms will take care of themselves mm -hmm. uh, over time. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I asked Gabby Gifford mm -hmm. her last time, her last run before she got hurt, um, was would you support, and I ask you, um, would you support the establishment of a national commission on economic justice? Wow, I like it. <laughs> I like that idea. I think um, anything we can do to put together a group of people that can specify and target the, the symptoms and bring truth to power, why not? I would love it. I think that's pennies on the dollar compared to what we're, we're, we're up against right now. Um, I would go as bold as 
putting a challenge to them that our economy right now, the way it's set up, is not meant to help people. In fact, it is meant to help the few that own automation and AI. And that is a coming reality very soon. And our system and our economy is not gonna distribute that wealth. It's not gonna give that wealth to anyone. We got right now a situation with Amazon. You don't have to look farther than Amazon. They first destroy mom and pop stores. Then they hire a lot of people in their warehouses. A lot of people, right? Great jobs. Starvation wages, actually. Uh, they're on food stamps, actually. At the same time, Jeff Bezos announces Amazon Go, which is a cashierless payment system, to yeah. get rid of the second largest job in America. Yeah. And at the same time, 70% of the public still approves of Amazon. And at the same time, Jeff Bezos got $2 billion in a uh, higher net worth, personal net worth from that announcement. This is not an economy that's gonna work for everybody. No. You know, people need purchasing power. You don't, you don't have people that can purchase things, you ain't gonna have a thriving economy. You know, you have people with a mass amount of student debt, they're gonna be paying back their debt, not buying houses and cars. Right. So I would love that idea. And maybe when I'm in office, you can be on that team. Absolutely, this is another rocket science fight. This is not rocket science. Victimless crimes. I think some of us know people that don't deserve to be in prison. I think, I think victimless crimes uh, don't deserve that kind of treatment. I'm talking about uh, marijuana users. I'm talking, to, uh, I, don't, I don't get how we think this is a system that um, makes these people better people. It makes people worse. They come out of this, if you didn't go in jaded, if you didn't go in a nasty person, you spend long enough in the right jail, in the right prison, you'll come out terrible. You'll come out with a completely different psyche because it's like either you're a victim or you're an aggressor. Which are you gonna be? And both have terrible ramifications on the person. Right now, they don't even have human rights. I mean, you got 5,000 inmates to one healthcare provider in there. You got private prisons making profit on this. We have, what, 5% of the world population, but 25% of the incarcerated? What, are Americans that violent? Are we that crazy? No, 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 it's a system. It's a system, and uh, we gotta be doing better to allow people that have made a mistake in their life to, to ratify that and to change their life, and let's allow them to have a second chance in society. You know how many felons I met shaking hands trying to get petition signatures? And they're like, oh, I can't help you out. I'm a felon. I mean, I get it to a certain degree, but after a certain time, 30 years, 40 years, let's go all the stream, 50 years after being a felon, why can't that person get back into the community and vote? Yeah, yeah. Just doesn't, I mean, I think that person paid a price already. Uh, but we, we have, and you know what I was talking to? I was talking to these healthcare providers, um, um, the name is leaving my mind, it's Pima County something, it's a four letter acronym. Uh, they are helping inmates right now, coming out because uh, they don't have money, they don't have a source of income, and many of them will just get back into the cycle if they don't get help. So these, these healthcare providers will go in there, get them registered uh, with, uh, with, a, with a healthcare program, uh, like Access, for example, and so that the moment they come out, they have healthcare, so they don't have to worry about healthcare, and they can focus on getting a job. You know, these are little things that make a big difference. And, and veterans the, too in criminal justice. What about the disproportionate number of people of color oh. who are incarcerated? I know, and you know, one in one in four homicides in, involves a black person. I mean, there, and and that's a culture that we need to address. And more than ever, I'm realizing there is fundamental racism in the other side, and it's coming out more than I've ever expected, or I thought you know, naively that wasn't true. But the worst part of humans now, or the worst part of the Republican Party is now coming out and it's like front and center and they're championing it and they're holding it strong. I'm okay to be a race, woo, you know? What has happened? But that, it doesn't stop in the community. It's, it's, it goes into our criminal justice system as well. I mean, court case after court case, why, do, why are people rioting in the streets? Why did Baltimore flip upside down that one time? I mean, there is, there is some truth to their, their struggle. There is some truth to Hispanic struggle. 
there's some truth to uh, other minority. I mean, J Japanese in, in those in internment camps. I mean, what, what is it? It's not called endearment camps. Internment. Internment. Internment camps. I mean, we have a history of this. We have a history of doing this, and I'm so happy that you see that, and you're on this side of of the aisle, that you're defending this, that you're here today listening to me, um, and, I, and I hope for your support, because like, I, I, guess, I guess there wasn't much we disagreed on, you know, coming at the end of this. I think there was a lot we agree on, and you can see that I care about the issue, that I'm authentic, that I know what I'm fighting for, and I'm, I'm born and raised in this community, and I, and I feel strongly that I can make a good impact when I get to Congress. We thank you.